first John K. L. lecture series for this year. Um, there's many new faces in the crowd, so just so you're aware, um, this was a lecture series that we started about two years ago and named it after one of our um, longtime supporter and board members, John Hale. Uh, his wife, here, Barbara, is here with us tonight, and also is very supportive as well. Um, for those who don't know, um, restrooms are um, down the hallway in the back here, and then upstairs if you go right when you get to the top of the steps. Um, we do apologize. We do <clears throat> Usually we start these in March or April, um, but we recently opened a new building behind the museum here called The Barn. Um, so at a different time or afterwards, if you let me know, we can let you in and see um, what that's like. So this entire area was full this um, the last couple months of stuff, and it was moved it out. So if you notice, we have a lot more leg room to move around now, which is good. Um, we'll be taking a break in July, but then we'll, our next lecture after this will be on August 15th, and then it'll be by William C. Jack Davis, um, who's going to be talking about his new book uh, on Loretta Velasquez, um, who was a Civil War a female during the Civil War, who was a Confederate impersonator, and all kinds of stuff. Um, the book's for sale on Amazon, so I would encourage you to buy it if you want to. We'll be happy to sign up for the April lecture. Um, and last, but or two, two other quick things. Um, we're getting ready to start our membership drive. So if you're here and you want to renew your membership or you want to join the society, um, there's membership cards upstairs that you can find on the way out the door. There's also a nice donation jar if you feel so inclined as well um, to help support this. Um, and last but not least, um, I'm sure everybody um, from the area remembers the Long Way Home drama that they used to do in Radford from the 71 to 99, I think it was. Well, they're actually going to start it again this year. Um, four weekends during the summer in June, July, August, and September. Um, these will be upstairs at the door, too. Um, but I would encourage you, if you're interested in going, um, to buy your tickets fast because they are selling out very quickly. I think the June one actually is probably already sold out. It'll be at the Nestlerod on the new um, in Fairlawn in the evening on Sunday evenings during the last Saturday or last Sunday of the month. So I would encourage you to see it if you want to. They've changed the play a little bit. It's only about an hour long now as opposed to, I think it was roughly two, two and a half hours when I used to see it when I was a kid. But without further ado, um, tonight we are pleased to welcome Dr. Daniel Thorpe, um, who's a history or associate professor of history at Virginia Tech. Dr. Thorpe received his PhD and Master's of Arts from the John Hopkins University and a Bachelor's of Arts from Davidson College. He was the recipient of the prestigious Fulbright Scholarship to New Zealand in 2002 and received the Advancing Women Award in 2006 and the William E. Wine Award for Teaching Excellence in 2013. He's published numerous articles and books, including one that I found interesting this morning, um, I actually bought on Amazon, um, <laughs> called Lewis and Clark and American Journey. Um, his areas of expertise include comparative history of British, the British colonies, history of African Americans in Southwest Virginia, and the subject he will be speaking with us tonight, European colonization and exploration in North Um, I, I think this, the, the images aren't critical to what I'm doing, so hopefully this will be big enough. If not, we'll have to move the table back a little bit. Um, I appreciate the, the offer. This is taking me back to my origins, almost. Um, I am by training an early American historian. And uh, in fact, much of part of what you're going to hear tonight is based on this material I originally encountered working on my doctoral dissertation. Uh, 35 years ago, on Moravian settlement in North Carolina. Um, lately, as, as, as Joe mentioned, I've been working um, on 19th, almost 20th century history, uh, specifically African American history of Montgomery County, um, which I've just about finished now, or at least the big project. So it, it's, fun, it's always fun to go back to uh, the, the 17th, 17th and 18th century. Um, I would never want to live then, but my, my heart is still sort of firmly ensconced in the, in the, the 18th century. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is, is, we'll talk about a few individuals. Actually, it's appropriate you mentioned the, the long way home, long journey home. We will talk briefly about the, the Drapers and, the, and Drapers Meadow. But I want to talk more, I guess, about the, the larger issues of, of who the people were that, at least those we can identify, uh, who settled in the <coughs> New River Valley, where they came from, why they were here, 
and briefly at least what sort of uh, community they created. We need to start by the familiar uh, trilogy, I guess. Um, historians often say, just as a rule of thumb, that everywhere in what was then called the backcountry, uh, western Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, Virginia, the Carolinas, that the population is roughly a third English, a third Scots Irish, and a third German. We don't know exactly. But I want to talk a little bit about each of those groups and who they, just who they were. That will do the old fashioned way. My battery seems to have died. Okay. Um, the English are the most well known, obviously. Uh, this being Virginia, uh, named for Queen Elizabeth. Uh, the early settlers had come to Jamestown in 1607. And by the Really, by the late 17th century, uh, 1670s, 1680s, what is now Eastern Virginia was already getting crowded. Um, the vast majority of the settlers, as, as we as we know, were growing tobacco, uh, and tobacco is hideously hard on land, and so. To continue growing even an acre of tobacco, a farmer needed about 20 acres of land in order to rotate through the land to avoid uh, soil exhaustion. So Virginia, the English in eastern Virginia were gobbling up land. And by the and in fact, it's a, as a result, in the 1670s, the, the first known English exploration of the New River Valley occurred. Uh, men became, became coming, began coming up here in the 1670s uh, and encountered what they then called Woods River, uh, what we now call the New River. So the English were the, the largest population in Virginia. Those we'll talk about, they were, not, they were not actually the largest by any means in this area, but they, they are the original settlers of Virginia and one important stream of those who eventually worked their way into the New River Valley. Less, I mean, equally familiar, but kind of still a bit mysterious to people, are a group known variously as the Scots-Irish, the Scots-Irish, the Ulster Scots. These are the descendants of Scottish colonists sent from England to civilize Ireland. Uh, they are not Highland Scots. Uh, the Highland Scots are a totally different culture. These were a group known as the Lowland Scots. They, what, one of the important things that distinguishes the Lowland Scots from the Highland Scots is the Lowland Scots were Presbyterians. Many of the Highland Scots were Catholic. Um, the Lowland Scots were good Protestants. And England was looking for reliable Protestant colonists to send to Ireland, which was awash in Catholics, or at least people that were nominally Catholic. Uh, Ireland had been colonized, had been, had been converted by, the, by Catholics, um, but their reli the religion had become a mixture of sort of local folk religion and Catholicism that many Catholics elsewhere in Europe didn't even recognize as Catholicism. But to the English, uh, Ireland was a barbaric Catholic country that needed to be civilized. And the way of doing that, uh, starting in the Elizabethan era, actually, uh, late 16th century, was to promote settlement by reliable Scottish Presbyterians who would go to Ireland in return for free land and become dutiful servants of the Queen and civilize them, actually conquer the Irish. And we talk about this as colonization. It was, in fact, conquest, uh, and a very brutal conquest. Uh, much, many of the men who would eventually lead the way to, to North America uh, cut their teeth settling uh, Ireland. And one of my favorites is named Humphrey Gilbert, who allegedly, uh, in order to intimidate the locals, had the pathway up to his tent lined each day with the freshly severed heads of Irishmen 
so that those coming up to ask a favor might pass by their neighbors, uh, even their own family members. So it was a very nasty process. But it resulted in not the total submission of Ireland, but the settlement in Northern Ireland, which is where we now have you know, the, 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 the British community questionable uh, relations with the Irish Republic. These people um, had been quite successful uh, for almost a century. But beginning about 1700, the British settlers, the, the Scots-Irish, uh, the Ulster Scots, <laughs> began to suffer both um, religiously and economically. Economically, they were very successful making wool. Uh, Ireland, if you've ever been to Ireland, is a great place for sheep. Uh, it's, it's cool and damp and grass grows very well. So Ireland was a washing sheep that produced very nice wool. Unfortunately, the Scots-Irish woolen manufacturers were competing with the English, who didn't like that. Uh, and so in 1699, uh, Parliament passed what's called the Woolens Act that basically destroyed the, the Northern Irish woolens industry. Uh, many of the Scots Irish weavers were suddenly bankrupt, or at least out of a job, and so desperately trying to find some alternative way to make a living. At the same time, the Church of England was becoming less um, tolerant towards Presbyterians. We think of England, you know, we think of Americans and English as sort of, in some way, interested in religious freedom. Um, England was not interested in religious freedom. It was interested in the state church, the Church of England. And so, in again, right about the same time, 1703, the Parliament passed a test act that in order for uh, a Presbyterian to serve English government, to hold English positions, they had to take an oath which many of the Presbyterians objected to because it was an oath to the Church of England. It's not the sort of persecution we think of with something like the Holocaust, but it did cut many Scots-Irish out of public life. So for a combination of both economic and social reasons, uh, a, number of Scots, a, a number of Scottish residents of Northern Ireland, Scots-Irish, were by 1710, 1715, looking for a new home. And for the next 50 years, uh, until the American Revolution came along, uh, from about 1720 into the 1770s, thousands of Scots-Irish migrated to North America. Originally to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania uh, had large amounts of empty land at, at that time in the early 18th century, lots of empty land. And the government of Pennsylvania, under the Penn family, was, by the standards of the 18th century, remarkably tolerant to other religions. And so Presbyterians could worship there with no problem, they could serve in government, they could vote. Uh, there, were, there were no restrictions on Presbyterian activity, either religiously or socially or culturally, uh, in Pennsylvania. And so Pennsylvania attracted significant numbers of Scots-Irish, beginning about 1720. Again, moving in, initially to the city of Philadelphia, and then came to Philadelphia. So that's our second group of actors. Third is a bit of an anachronism. Um, they're known as Germans. There was no Germany in the 18th century. What there were were two dozen little bitty states, or big states in some cases, kingdoms, principalities, duchies, magravites, uh, a variety of German states, all of which spoke German, all of which had in many ways a common German culture and heritage. But by the 17th, early 18th century, had often violent conflicts over religion. What's now Germany, this welter of small states, 
was the center of some of the worst fighting in Europe during the 17th century, uh, as ca mainly Catholics and Protestants fought one another. And for people living there, this was incredibly difficult. I mean, not only did you have armies coming through your, your village every now and then, uh, and conscripting people, or taking your cattle, or burning down your house. In, all, in almost all of these jurisdictions, you had no choice what your religion was going to be. You worship as, your, as the leader of your state told you to worship. So you might, be, you might be in a Protestant community for 10, 15 years. And then if the leader of the, if the, leader of the state died and was replaced by an heir or decided to convert, you had to adopt a different religion, whether you wanted to or not. Um, both militarily and culturally, many of the Germans, particularly in a region called the Palatinate, is right kind of on the border of uh, France and what's now Germany. Many of the uh, residents, residents of the Palatinate suffered particularly from the, war, the, the fighting that was occurring during the 17th century. And like the Scots-Irish, thousands of Germans desperately wanted to go somewhere else. Well, this is just the point at which a German became the king of England. King George I didn't even speak English. He was from one of the German states, and when he, when he became king of England, uh, he and his government retained a soft spot for German Protestants. Not Catholics, uh, but the German Protestants. And many of the Palatinate Germans were Protestants. And so when uh, they began looking for, for homes to get out of uh, war-torn Germany, England welcomed them, not so much in England, as in English colonies. Because, again, uh, England had lots of land and not that many people, and it wanted people to settle on its country, in, in its countryside, in, in its colonies. And so, again, right about the same time as the Scots-Irish, beginning about 1720, for the next 40 years, thousands of Germans migrated to British America, and again, particularly to Pennsylvania. These, in fact, are the people that we think of as Pennsylvania Dutch. Dutch is simply a corruption of Deutsch, or German. Uh, these were various German Protestants that, again, like many of the Scots-Irish, initially arrived in Philadelphia, moved out into the countryside, and began to establish themselves as very successful farmers. Finally, one other group that I do <clears throat> want to introduce, a distinct minority, but nevertheless present, we forget them sometimes, are African Americans. While most of the settlers in the New River Valley were English, Scots-Irish, or German, um, a significant number were African American slaves. <coughs> they had been in Virginia almost as long as the English had been. We don't actually know precisely when the first Africans arrived in Virginia. The earliest we know of uh, was 16, 1619. And so by the time of the American Revolution, um, African slaves, or African Americans, uh, who had become slaves eventually, uh, had been in Virginia for a century and a half. <clears throat> These are in many cases fourth and fifth generation uh, individuals. And by the 18th century, Slavery had become a significant element in the English economy and culture in Virginia. I mean, you, you don't have to have slaves to grow tobacco, obviously. But Virginians discovered it was a lot easier if slaves did the work. And tobacco was profitable enough that you could afford, if you, if you had enough tobacco, you could afford to buy enough slaves to keep growing more tobacco. And so, during the course of the late 18th, or late, late 17th, early 18th century, um, the number of slaves in Virginia kept growing to the point that about a third of the colony's population was African American by the 1720s and 1730s. About, in other words, about three times uh, the current national population, nationally now about 12, 13% African American. Uh, Virginia was about 35% African American 
by the, 1840, or the 1740s. We don't know, uh, as I said, how many African Americans came to the New River Valley or even when they first came here. The earliest that we can absolutely document would probably just be the, the 1790 census. Uh, but by then, they were already more than 5% of the population uh, by 1790. And that number would keep growing in, in the years to follow. So we have four different populations who arrived here at about the same time, but from two very different directions. The New River Valley is a meeting, meeting point, not just for four different peoples, but for two very different population streams. The most well-known is from north to south. <coughs> the Scots-Irish and the Germans. Um, they had been pouring into Philadelphia for a generation. And by the 1740s, Eastern Pennsylvania was starting to fill up. So people kept moving further west. And this is the, the, the pattern throughout American history. Uh, as land in the east filled up, people moved west. Well, the problem with moving west in America, or at least on the east coast, is before long, you bump into a mountain. The Appalachian chain, or that series of, it's actually, as you can see, it's a, a series of parallel chains with valleys in between, uh, which angles from North Georgia all the way up to, to, uh, to uh, Maine, run through Pennsylvania, through central Pennsylvania. And so as settlement expanded out from Philadelphia, both the Germans and the Scots-Irish eventually hit the mountains, and they just turned left and headed south. And so beginning in the 1740s, you see Germans crossing into Maryland, into uh, the lower Shenandoah Valley, and working their way south, eventually reaching uh, southwest Virginia, the Carolinas, North Georgia, in fact, by the end of the Revolution. This became probably the most important stream of settlement into, again, what was generic called backcountry, certainly into southwest Virginia, is this steady stream of Scots, Irish, and Germans coming out of Pennsylvania. <coughs> Easterners, both black and white, also made their way. There are a few gaps. The James River, for example, uh, passes through a gap in the mountains. Uh, the Roanoke River passes through a gap in the mountains. And so there were a few places along the Appalachian chain where it was possible to move from eastern Virginia into the interior. Uh, and a growing number of White Virginians, some bringing their slaves with them, uh, followed those, mainly those river valleys, uh, going up along the Potomac, the James, the, the Roanoke. These two lines, these two groups, or these four groups, these two uh, uh, pathways met in the Roanoke Valley and the upper Shenandoah Valley, sort of from Stanton south. Now, part of this was, as I've been describing, um, a push factor. There were lots of just individual small farmers who wanted a better livelihood. They could not get enough land to support their family in Pennsylvania or in eastern Virginia, and so they moved west or southwest looking for more land. That push factor um, was probably the most important. But there was, there was also a pull factor that is often forgotten about. Uh, and that was basically corporate greed, at least the 18th century version of it. Um, the equivalent in the 18th century, I guess, of Google or Amazon in southwest Virginia uh, were what were called land companies. The land where we're located, the land in western Virginia, was claimed by the King of England as English land that the king could dispose of as he saw fit, through, usually through his agent, the, the governor of Virginia. And what often happened, 
And so the English government wanted to encourage settlement in southwest Virginia, much as it had in Ireland. What they did in southwest Virginia is prominent individuals, uh, often political leaders, were authorized to create companies. And they'd be given title to 60,000, 70,000, 500,000 acres of land on the condition that they had to bring settlers to that land. One settler for every 1,000 acres, 500 acres, whatever the, whatever the, the, the government agreed or, or wanted. The settlers got their land for, for free, though they had what's called quick rent. You paid an annual, um, I won't call it a token rent, because it was an, a relatively significant amount of money. Not like you know, renting an apartment nowadays where you're paying a, a significant part of your income. But it was enough money that the company could make money, the king could make money, and then of course these people, the theory was, uh, would become an economy that would provide exports to England, import English goods, pay taxes when they did so. So the land companies were a mechanism by which the crown would establish settlement in these remote corners of the world. There were at least three operating uh, in this area. The, the Woods River Company, named for the original name of, of the New River. This is the one that James Patton, uh, whose family helped establish Smithfield. Um, James Patton was a member of the uh, Woods River Company. Lawrence Washington, who was uh, George Washington's older brother, the man who actually built Mount Vernon. Uh, Lawrence Washington and some of his, some of the leaves actually along with Washington, uh, were part of a company called the Ohio Company. And then uh, Thomas Jefferson's father, uh, Peter Jefferson, uh, along with uh, Josiah Fry, Joshua Fry, who was a, a, a surveyor, and a man named Thomas Walker, uh, they were instrumental in what was called the Loyal Lands Company. Uh, so the Woods River Company, the Ohio Company, the Loyal Lands Company were all trying to recruit settlers to, to settle this area. They all had grants for this area, and they literally had agents in Pennsylvania. Uh, in some cases, back in England and in Germany, uh, handing out brochures, basically advertising, you know, come to Southwest Virginia. Uh, land is abundant, Indians aren't the problem, the weather is beautiful, you know, come on down. And it worked. I mean, thousands of uh, Scots Irish, thousands of Germans, thousands of English settlers began pouring into the area. Most of them came as just individual families. And very few, so this is not a case of someone waking up in Germany one day, or waking up in England and saying, you know, I think I'm going to go to Giles County. Uh, that was not the standard pattern for migration. The, 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 the pattern, the, the, the more typical pattern, was a long series of small steps. And one of the clearest examples we have of this, actually, is uh, the Harmon family. Uh, Eventually, Adam Harmon, where, the, where uh, Mary, Mary Draper Ingalls came back, uh, that family, the Harmon family. Um, we can trace them from Germany to the New River. Valley through a series of stops along the way. Eventually, became anglicized as it's actually Herman now in, 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 for a lot of people in this area. Uh, but Heinrich and uh, Louisa Katrina, uh, the Hermans, were uh, both German by birth, married in Germany in 1723. So we have the church record of their marriage in uh, the Latin in 1723. Three years later, 1726, they were on the Isle of Man. So this, is, this is part of Great Britain. Uh, they were among those German Protestants who had accepted the invitation of George I and moved to the British world. So they were on the Isle of Man in 1726. Uh, three years later, in 1729, they were living in Pennsylvania. A few years later, by the mid-1730s, they were living in Strasburg, Virginia, uh, down in the lower Shenandoah Valley. And sometime by 1745, they had settled on the New River. Uh, actually, initially near where Radford Arsenal is now, uh, in the horseshoe uh, of the New River. So there may have been other moves in between. Uh, we know of these only because this is where children were born. 
And so we know that they were living. So we know it was at least four steps as they worked their way along. This was the most common pattern. Is that people did not, in the 18th century, pick up and move 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles. Uh, they tended to move in small, smaller chunks, often over a couple of years. And often, uh, and we see this particularly with uh, the Germans and Scots-Irish in this area, more so than the English, it's often what's called chain migration. So one brother goes to southwest Virginia, or goes to Pennsylvania, and, then up, and writes back and says, hey, this is great, come on over. And another brother comes, and then three cousins, and eventually you get a whole extended family settled in a region uh, who came not as a family, not as a, as a group, uh, but as individuals following one another uh, and eventually settling near one another. But there were some larger groups. Um, and this is one of my favorite parts of the history of this region because I, my, my doctoral dissertation was on the Moravians. The Moravians are not very well known nowadays, but they were a group of um, German pietists in the 18th century. And the 18th century is full of these sorts of wacky religions, including one known as the Effort of Brethren. Um, if you're ever in southwestern Pennsylvania, um, I encourage you to go to the Effort of Cloisters. They're fantastic buildings. Looks, they're totally medieval, uh, set in the middle of, of southwestern Pennsylvania, or south central Pennsylvania. Excuse me. Yeah. Eastern Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, thank you. Eastern. <laughs> I laugh. Yeah. Where are you from? We live in near Lancaster. Right. So, yes. I forgot. Um, Effort is, I guess, between Lancaster and. Right. And, okay. I haven't, I haven't been up there for a number of years, but it's a fantastic place to visit. Anyway, the, the Effort of Brethren, these were um, dissenting Lutherans, basically. The Germany in, in the late 17th, early 18th century had an enormous religious revival uh, known as Pietism in which uh, individuals broke off of, among other things, the Lutheran church because they felt the Lutheran church was too intellectual. Um, among those were a group that today, their descendants today, uh, and they're still in Southwest Virginia, uh, are the German, German Baptist Brethren. known colloquially as an individual named Conrad Biesel, who was a German pietist. He followed them, and Biesel began to create what amounts to a Protestant monastery in Pennsylvania. The brothers and sisters lived, they, they, were, they were cloisters. They, uh, it didn't require celibacy, but they encouraged celibacy. They encouraged vegetarianism. They encouraged a uniform dress. And they followed a daily schedule very much like a Catholic monastery. Um, the, the rooms in which the, the individuals slept, like cells, had a board with a basically piece of a 4 by 4 for a pillow. And you would go to bed at sundown, wake up about midnight to go pray, then go back to bed for a few hours, then wake up to pray and start working. Uh, it was very much a life devoted to um, prayer, in theory, devoted to prayer and to uh, work. Like many religions, they had a schism. Uh, members of the, the, the congregation, uh, particularly some of the four brothers, uh, Samuel, Emmanuel, Israel, and Gabriel Eckerman, uh, the Eckerman brothers, disagreed with Conrad Diesel, and so they left Ephrata in 1745, and they went, as they said, they fled toward the setting sun until they were beyond all Christian governments. Where they were was actually Clater Lake, at least what's now Clater Lake. Under Clater Lake, uh, if you're old enough or enough of an antiquarian to look at old maps, you know that under Clater Lake is a thing, place called Dunkard Bottom. That's how it got its name. That was where the Eckerlins settled. They did their best to establish a community like Ephrata uh, at Dunkard Bottom. They quickly encountered one problem. Uh, Thomas Walker came to and talked about this. It's hard to be a vegetarian when 
there's no crops initially. I mean, they've got their, their deer and there's turkeys, but they're not really vegetables. Uh, and so the effort of the, the, the renegades didn't follow all of the rules, and they didn't stay very long. Uh, they, they were gone within about five years. Uh, they arrived here about 1745. Uh, they were still here in, in early, the early 1750s when Thomas Walker came through. Uh, and soon after, the, the community began filtering away. Some back to Ephrata. Uh, some actually went down to North Carolina, to what's now Winston-Salem, where the, they encountered the Moravians and, and settled in that area. Uh, and others just sort of drifted away. So there were the occasional organized settlement uh, or settlement process. But the vast majority of the settlers who came to this area were simply individuals in family groups. Now, what they created by our standards, it was a primitive, raw community. But I want to emphasize that it was a functioning community. It did have a few well-to-do individuals. Uh, that's Smithfield Plantation, built about 1772 by the Preston family. Um, probably the wealthiest family in the area. Uh, yeah, I mean, originally, when they first got here, probably living in, in uh, holes in the ground or just tents. Uh, these houses were fairly easy to build, fairly quick to build. And what quickly developed in South Virginia was what one historian of, of, of ethnic groups has called an open society dotted with closed enclaves. There were no laws saying where you had to live. You could live anywhere you wanted to. In fact, one of the problems was the total chaos of not knowing where you were or whose land you were on. Uh, people would come in, well, I like this land, I'm going to claim it, and not know if somebody else had already claimed it a year before or a week before. So it's a very open community. Um, people relied on their neighbors, and we will talk about in a few minutes. They, they interacted uh, across religious lines, across racial lines, across ethnic lines. But they tended to live and associate most closely with people of the same religion and the same language. So you had German communities, Scots-Irish communities, English communities that might be a mile or two apart, and they would often trade with one another and increasingly intermarry, but they tended to trust one another and associate with one another. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this actually is when I was in college. Um, I went to Davidson College, which is outside Charlotte. And there actually is a, a creek in um, Romain County, a Buffalo Creek. And the branches of that creek to this day are named Irish Buffalo Creek, German Buffalo Creek, and Scotch Buffalo Creek, uh, or English Buffalo Creek, because that's where the communities live. And they often spoke their, their native language. Uh, Germans in this area spoke German. This is one of the things I, I went back a number of years ago to, as a sort of consultant at uh, Old Salem. Um, and they were talking about doing a, a, visit, a visitor's program. And I kept, I don't think they ever did this, I kept encouraging them in the background with, as it's beginning, have people speaking German. Because that's what you would have heard if you had walked into uh, any of these German communities in southwest Virginia. The Harmons did not speak English around the house. They, in many cases, learned German, learned English, but German was their first language. And it's one of the reasons that these groups tended to associate with one another, is they could talk to one another. They also tended to be of the same religion. So the, the English tended to be Anglicans, the Scots-Irish tended to be Presbyterians, and the Germans tended to be either Lutheran or one of the pietist branches of uh, Lutheranism. Uh, and so they established their own churches and worshipped together, uh, tended to intermarry. Eventually, these would blend, and you would, you would get an American population that combines them all. And I suspect most of us in here have some Scots-Irish blood, some German blood, and some English blood all mixed together. 
But initially, uh, they tended to live fairly isolated lives. <clears throat> and it was, by our standards, a rather Spartan existence. Um, I mentioned the Moravians a couple of times. One of the, the, reason, the reason historians like love Moravians is Moravians wrote down everything. Uh, they kept records about everything. And one of the we have uh, the Moravians settled around Bethlehem, Pennsylvania originally, uh, and they were coming from Bethlehem because they had heard there were Germans down here. Uh, and the Moravians were extremely active as proselytizers. They wanted to take the gospel wherever they could. So they went down here looking for these Germans. This is just a part of the diary these two Moravians wrote. I'm going to read you a couple days worth as they made their way sort of from uh, Finn Castle to Radford. That was the approximate route. November 1st, or November 7th, excuse me. Our path led through the mountains. We heard an awful howling of wolves in the morning, quite near. We wished them far away. When we crossed the Catawba Creek, and Catawba Creek runs um, from Blacksburg up towards the town of Catawba. Who owns a mill. Here we expected to get some bread, but his answer was, there was not a bit of bread in the house. We went two miles further, and as we heard that there was no house for 12 miles, we stayed there overnight. The next day, it snowed the whole night. We started early in the morning and went along on our way, which was quite narrow and very wet on account of the snow. This is, this is what passed for a road at this time. Moreover, we had to cross the Catawba Creek and a branch of the Roanoke River more than 30 times. And of course, there are no bridges, but they're just wading through this in, in November snow. There was no house for the first 12 miles, and then none for the next 15 miles. But although we were in the water nearly the whole day, the Lord helped us through and brought us in the evening to an English house where we enjoyed the comforts of a good fire. We had also a pleasant conversation with our host. On Sunday, November 9th, we are glad in anticipation of seeing the new river today and ask the Lamb, what the Moravians called Jesus, ask the Lamb for a favorable reception among the Germans. Toward noon, we arrived safely at the new river. We were taken across the river to Jakob Harman, who together with his wife received us with great joy and love. And they went on to stay for a few days preaching in the neighborhood. But this is a community where you were lucky to find a house every seven or eight miles if you're traveling on, on the main road. Uh, they describe eating whatever they, basically whatever they can find. Uh, a lot of hominy. Um, occasionally bread, but not much in the way of, of bread because no one had, there, there weren't that many mills to grind the flour in 1749. So it's a, it's a very simple form of life. But this is still a relatively settled agricultural community. Very, very quickly, farmers in the New River began clearing the forests and mainly planting uh, initially corn. Uh, corn was the, the favorite crop of virtually all frontiers people because it takes almost no preparation to grow corn. You don't even need to get rid of the trees. They could, in this case, they've actually cut them down by now. But you could actually just girdle the trees, which would kill the leaves. Then the sun could come through. And all you had to do was then plant corn around the trees. And when it was ready, you just go out and pick the, you didn't have to have a plow, didn't have to have a threshing machine, didn't even need to have to have a mill. Uh, corn could be, could be eaten without being milled. So initially, people grew corn, but their goal was to switch over to wheat, uh, which most people regarded as more civilized. Corn was for cattle, uh, or people who were still quite crude, uh, and as quickly as possible wanted to start raising wheat. But grain was the principal crop in this area. Even though the English knew about tobacco, um, tobacco was not important in the early economy of the New River Valley because you couldn't do anything with it. You could grow it very easily, but then what? You can't get it to market. Um, in eastern Virginia, tobacco was generally put on in, in hogsheads and put on boats and taken down rivers. What are you going to do here? Put it on the new river? And then what? 
you know, if you can get it past the falls and the, and the rapids, you get into the Kanawha and the Ohio, and, well, this isn't going to help any. So uh, there was no way to get tobacco to the market. So the economy tended to be... Uh, based on, on brain. Not because they were out of this area. <laughs> yep, it's whiskey. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the, if you look at almost any inventory from this era, people had stills. Uh, not because they're all alcoholics, but because that was how you could, you could convert corn into something that was uh, more stable. It didn't rot uh, and more portable. But most of the corn, though, actually was simply sold to people coming in. New settlers continued pouring into this region. That was the market that fueled this economy. The original economy of the New River Valley was basically fueled by feeding newcomers, providing cloth for newcomers from uh, um, sheep raised here, providing meat from your cattle, providing uh, not so much milk as butter. Milk wouldn't keep, butter would. Uh, every year, a new, a new group of settlers would arrive. And until they got their own farms up and running, they needed to buy everything. And that was what brought money into this area. Money that could then be used to buy exports. You know, we, we think of self-sufficiency. People were rarely self-sufficient. Almost immediately in any community, including Southwest Virginia, the New River Valley, people began to establish uh, taverns, Taverns and stores were often the same building. You would buy pretty much everything. It was the Walmart of the New River Valley you know, in the 18th century. And it was all, we know a lot about this because of the account books people left. You know, again, we tend to think that this was a barter economy. And people have this, this notion that, okay, I need to get a gun. So, I'll just fill my wagon with 40 bushels of corn, and I'll go to the store and I'll drop off 40 bushels of corn in exchange for a gun. It's not how it worked. It was more like a credit card economy. When you need something, you go to the general store or tavern, you, act, you get what you need, and the storekeeper writes down, okay, you got five pounds of uh, sugar, you owe me seven shillings, and keeps a running tab. And maybe once a year, you'll sell your crop, or you'll, one of the big money makers was to go out and hunt deer and export deer hides. Uh, so maybe once a year, you'll sell a bunch of deer hides, you'll get some money, you'll go to the store and settle up your bill. Or at least, you know, try to settle it up. You may actually have a surplus, in which case you get a credit at the store. Uh, and when you come back next time, you get your, the, the, the storekeeper just subtracts it. Um, there's almost no cash in this economy. People did not have paper money or coins. Almost everything was done by credit. But it was all very carefully documented, uh, thank goodness for, for, for those of us who are historians. And very few, again, very few people were genuinely self-sufficient, even this early. Now beyond farming and families, there really was almost nothing in the way of institutions. Uh, there was basically no reliable government because for most of this period before the revolution, all right, we're way down here. There's the county seat in Stanton. We were a we were part of uh, Augusta County. For years, I went up through well, crossing the Tall Creek 30 times uh, to get up to Augusta to register your, your deed. There were only a few organs of government in this area. There were justices of peace in this area. So, for small crimes, uh, a local court could, could try. Not, nothing big. Anything big, you had to go to Stanton or all the way to, to Rich, or all the way to Williamsburg uh, for, for trial. Um, there was no police force. There was a militia. At least it was supposed to be. Uh, just volunteer, whoever in the neighborhood would volunteer. But 
A few years later, George Washington said raising the militia in Virginia was like trying to raise the dead. Uh, militiamen were not all that enthusiastic about serving. So there's really not much in the way of, of any government in this area, which is actually one of the things that attracted some people to this area. Uh, if, you were, if, if you were bankrupt in Philadelphia, just head for southwest Virginia. No one knew who you were. You could start all over again. Almost the only institution was churches. These began almost immediately. Again, by and large, Anglican churches in, among the English settlers, uh, Presbyterian churches among the Scots-Irish settlers, and Lutheran churches, or some variant of Lutheranism uh, among the Germans. There was, however, no religious structure. I mean, there are no bishops, there are no um, synods. There were just isolated <coughs> churches, often without a minister. Uh, there would often just be a lay preacher or a passing Moravian missionary who would come through. Moravians would preach to anybody. Uh, and anybody would listen to them. Uh, the, the English, we, fine, you're, you're, you're a Moravian, we're English, we don't care. Come in and just give us a sermon, we don't care. Um, and occasionally people would go even to one another's churches. This is one of the ways in which those separate enclaves began merging uh, was in, in church. It was still a small, crude, uh, isolated community. But it was important because the presence of these English and Scots-Irish settlers in southwestern Virginia antagonized or scared the French, who had been working their way from what's now Canada down into the Ohio, western Pennsylvania. And so by the early 1750s, the French decided they needed to begin to fortify this region. And so they set out to establish forts in what's now Ohio and Pennsylvania. One of those forts, what's now Pittsburgh, became the flashpoint for what would become the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War. That, in turn, led to the expulsion of the French and, to many historians, the opening round of the American Revolution. And that, of course, led to the creation of the United States. So in some ways, you know, settlement here in the New River Valley directly led to the creation of the United States. Uh, we are in Philadelphia now. We are the, the, the birthplace of the United States is, is here in the New River Valley. All right, I've, good, I didn't go too long. I wanted to leave time for questions. Um, thank you for your patience, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have.